Okay, so welcome to the 14th LISO Symposium and thank you for joining this uh, parallel session one on LISA instrumentation. I am Rita Dolesi of the University of Trento and uh, INFN. And uh, uh, in this first part, before the break, our speakers will be Mary Sophie Hartig, Sara Pachowski, and uh, Daniel Georg. So, and uh, uh, for the questions, please, uh, questions may be submitted via the chat at any time. If you wish to ask a question verbally, please raise a hand or include a comment with your question on the chat. Questions from the live stream on YouTube are also welcomed. All questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. So we can, I believe we can start with uh, uh, Marie-Sophie Hartig of the Leibniz Universität Hannover, Max Planck Institute for Gravitational Physics, speaking about tilt to length coupling in LISA Pathfinder, data analysis and lesson learned for LISA. Marie-Sophie. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, let me quickly share my screen. Yes, I hope you now all see my screen. Um, yes. I'm happy to talk about uh, total links coupling today, which was a significant uh, noise source in LISA Pathfinder and is expected to be a major noise source also in LISA. Therefore, I will um, present you our recent results of the analysis of the LISA Pathfinder data and uh, what we learned from that um, in regard of uh, LISA. Since my talk is uh, the first uh, total links coupling talk, I'll start with a very brief introduction of this noise. So total links coupling is the unwanted coupling of um, angular or lateral jitter of either the spacecraft or a test mast um, into the phase signal. And um, taking for example, the example of the um, test mass jitter, this can um, look the, the following way. Um, we have here a test mass, uh, which, is, uh, which tilts, and therefore the beam pass uh, changes, um, hence also the phase signal would. Um, likewise, we refer to lateral jitter coupling as uh, tilt to length coupling, um, since it only couples into the signal if um, the test mass in this case is a priori tilted. Um, in terms of LISA Pathfinder, uh, we wanted to, to measure the relative um, distance changes of the two task masses, which are the golden blocks here inside the electrode housing, or their um, relative acceleration. Therefore, there was an optical bench in between with all the optical setup. Total links coupling. In case of LISA Pathfinder, was mostly the jitter of the spacecraft and hence the um, optical bench with respect to the test masses, which can also be interpreted as a jitter of the test masses with respect to the center of mass of the spacecraft. And it was the uh, limiting, without the question, the limiting noise source between 20 and 200 millihertz. Um, if you want to know more about uh, these pathfinder or the higher frequency noise, I can recommend the pre recorded talk by Leonard Visser. Um, so the, in the Pathfinder, there had been mainly two suppression strategies. Um, first of all, the tilt-to-length coupling did depend on the alignment of the test masses. Therefore, at three times the submission, the test masses had been realigned for direct tilt-to-length uh, coupling suppression. First, um, the first realignment took place after the engineering phase in March 2016. And it reduced, as shown here, the relative acceleration of the test masses from the red curve down to the green curve. So it uh, reduced the coupling significantly, however, still a uh, significant noise remained. Therefore, there was a second strategy, a subtraction strategy. Um, for that, the noise was uh, fitted and the fit model was then subtracted um, from the measurement. This is shown as a plot at the right hand side, where you can see again in red pre engineering noise, and um, in yellow is uh, the noise remaining after the subtraction. You find that you actually have higher noise at higher frequencies um, since the noise from the fitting quantities was added due to the um, subtraction of the fit. So both models themselves. Um, are not sufficient. So what had been done during the mission was to combine the two of them. First of all, the test masses had been realigned for 
uh, total length coupling reduction yielding the green curve here. And then the um, sub subtraction method was applied to that residual noise um, yielding finally the blue curve. So with that, total noise coupling was nicely subtracted from, uh, from the data during the mission. However, till the end of the mission, there was no real explanation of the um, of that coupling. So it wasn't understood why the realignment did not work as uh, as good as expected. And um, yeah, such an explanation would also be necessary to finally validate this suppression strategies which have been applied and which are also planned for LISA. And we don't really want to start LISA without having understood this voice. That's why we set up a new analytical model where all the coupling coefficients depend on the um, setup of the of these pathfinder and also the alignment of the uh, test masses. And in the following, I will compare that uh, new model with the um, with the fit model, which has been used for the subtraction strategy. Um, and apply that on, on the Lisa Pathfinder data. Mind that in the FIT model, we have three additional terms. Um, there was also fitted how the, um, the, the displacement of the task masses um, induced a change of the measured delta G and also how an acceleration of the spacecraft along the axis between the two task masses um, yeah, coupled into that signal. So these are not contained in the analytical model. The first um, series of data we investigated were, were that of the long crosstalk experiment, which took place in February 2017, and it was designed to test total length coupling. During that experiment, the um, test masses were brought to a total 12 um, set points, which means that they had been um, shifted and or realigned. Um, and at this new position, a series of injections were applied. First of all, the spacecraft has been made jittering um, laterally, then angularly, and third, um, injecting injections at different frequencies, a more uh, complex jitter was induced. Depending on the set points, this injection has been applied in one plane and or the other one, and hence the data provide a very nice test bed for our models. So we first took the FIT model and uh, checked if it can also uh, subtract these higher uh, induced noises during the um, yeah during that experiment. And this is shown at the figure at the left hand side, where in red you can see the measurement, in yellow you can see the what has been fitted. And if it were not at the injection frequencies, which are 10, 12, and 17 millihertz. Um, these nicely overlap, and hence in blue, the residual, residual is um, quite low. Also at higher frequencies, we see a nice reduction of the noise. The peaks you can still see here um, are at the multiples of the injection frequencies, and these are simply not covered by the linear fit model. We then did the same with the analytical model which is shown here at the right hand side. In red, you can see again the measurement, in yellow, the um, analytical model. And uh, since this did not contain the three additional terms, um, we fitted them additionally for a better comparison and then uh, subtracted both from the data yielding the um, blue curve. You can also already see that the residual noise is a, a little higher. However, in all 12 experiments, um, we were able to reduce the total length noise um, at the injection and at higher frequencies significantly, um, telling us that the analytical model in, in principle works. So we went on um, comparing then the four coupling coefficients which were um, um, available in both models. Uh, um, and the comparison showed that in most cases they, they nicely overlap, which then also um, validates uh, the FIT model. Um, telling that the coefficients um, yeah, somehow really rely on what has happened due to the realignments. Only in some cases for one coefficient, we still find uh, differences. Um, we as, as, um, so the, the cause of this is uh, subject to an ongoing investigation. Um, for time reasons, let me just say when we adapt the um, 
the analytical model accordingly or the general comparison accordingly, we find also coincidence um, in this case. Um, so we have these uh, two models um, coinciding ex ex um, yeah, and subtracting the um, injected noise where the analytical model um, was very complex to, to evaluate, while the FIT model does not yield any explanation about um, the dependency of the coupling on the test bus alignment. However, having the long cross tag experiment, we can use the um, fitted coefficients to find a third model, which like the analytical model, um, gives us co coefficients um, and the dependency on the test mass alignment. Um, this is because we had this 12 experiments and a set of 12 total length coupling coefficients fitted, um, which all depend on the set, uh, test mass set points. So um, these are eight degrees of freedom plus an additional offset. Um, so we can just run and have an overdetermined um, system of equation and can just run a minimizer to find that the dependency of this coupling coefficients on the task mass alignments. We did that and um, for all the coefficients, um, the result of the minimizer nicely coincided with the, um, with the fitted coefficients. So what we gained from the um, log cost experiment was a verification of um, the total length suppression strategies in general. And we now know that uh, also that we have finally an analytical model that can really explain the total length coupling in Lisa Pathfinder. So we now take that and um, go on to, to other times of submission and also analyze um, that data. And first of all, there are of course, um, so of course the data of the um, engineering days, which I referred to before, where the test masses had been realigned for a total length suppression. Um, and the angles, the real line that has been applied are shown here in this table. And we can take those angles, insert them into our analytical model, subtract it from the pre-engineering noise. And what we find is the purple curve here, which nicely overlaps uh, with the um, residual noise we had after the um, realignment of the test masses. Um, so, so we can actually model that, that residual noise with our analytical model. Uh, we can also do it the other way around and take the model and um, find the uh, coefficient or the, the angles um, for which the analytical model tells us that um, this realignment would have yielded a full suppression of the total length noise just by, um, by this realignment. And when we insert these into the model and subtract them, we again are yeah, finding uh, this purple curve, which overlaps with the result we got when subtracting the fit at this time of submission. However, the additional noise at higher frequencies wouldn't be present if you really perform the realignment, since it comes only from the subtraction. Okay, so we, with these angles, we would have said at this time of submission, we would have had a full suppression of the total length noise. Um, I say at this time of submission because we uh, still have to wonder if the um, total length coupling was stable throughout the full mission. And therefore we investigated the stability of the total length coupling coefficients. And we actually found that um, they are changing. Mostly this coefficient, this is that coefficient, um, did not only change for the test mass realignments uh, indicated here by the um, red lines, but also in between we see drifts and particularly here at the beginning of the um, so-called cool down, where the um, temperature within the satellite was um, decreased, we find a jump of the coefficient. And of course, we wondered what could have caused these changes, also there was no task mass rotation applied. And from the analytical model, we must say that we can um, explain these changes really only um, by real test mass rotations. Um, and particularly for this uh, cool down, we would have needed um, a differential uh, test mass rotation of 30 microradian. Um, the test mass angles were controlled for most of the time and also this time by the differential wavefront sensing angles, um, which did not change. Um, 
And so we assume that the um, beans must have been tilted for any other reason, such that this readout yielded a test mass rotation for correction. Um, and so we wondered what could have caused a beam tilt. Um, and there's uh, one scenario that could actually explain it, and which has been in investigated um, prior to launch. And this would be um, a banding of the optical bench due to uh, the thermal stresses on, on the mounts. Um, and then the beam would tilt, and this beam tilt would further increase to, uh, due to further um, reflections. So the analytical tilt to length coupling model actually yields an additional measure for the stability of the optical setup. Okay, let me summarize what I just told you. Um, we now know that total length coupling laser pathfinder can be directly um, reduced by a dedicated task mass realignment, which is also necessary for a good um, total length noise subtraction. Um, we have for the first time an analytical total length coupling model for laser pathfinder. Um, we can find a comparable model um, having the data from the low cost experiment using a minimizing routine. And uh, furthermore, we know that the coefficients are not stable, but drift and jump due to temperature changes. And uh, we know that we can use the analytical model, <coughs> sorry, for, to examine the, <coughs> sorry, the stability of the setup. And I promised you some <coughs> lessons learned for, for Lisa. Um, and LISA is different in, in many ways. So there's no direct translation of the analytical model. However, we can also um, deduce some general takeaway messages. First of all, due to the, um, since we now have an analytical model, we have a validation of the suppression strategies, which are also planned for LISA. So we are now confident that it is possible to um, really uh, suppress the total length noise to, to a certain level. Um, the suppression strategies are again a subtraction strategy, and Sarah will talk more about that in a subsequent talk. Um, we know that the initial level of total length noise can influence the quality of the result of the subtraction. And um, we can know that the a realignment um, can reduce total length coupling directly. This is planned in Lisa prior to launch. Um, and given that still the to the length noise is a little higher than expected and we face any problems. We have a backup option since we can apply a calibration scheme comparable to the log crosstalk experiment where we wouldn't even need the injections um, and can find the dependency of this coupling on the some realignment parameters. And we know that the total length coupling coefficients are not stable by drift, so they have to be recomputed regularly and temperature stability um, yeah, would be nice. Thank you. Thank you, Marie Sophie, very much. So I uh, think that the, the talk was very interesting, and very clear. So thank you. I don't see for the time being any questions. And uh, 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 there is one of David Robertson. Maybe if you have a quick answer, I don't know if it can be a quick answer. So, but he is asking for comment more on increase in noise at high frequency? Um, the increasing noise at higher frequencies. Um, or maybe you can- Can, can, can you add a few more details to that question, please? <laughs> that's a short answer. So given that we, have, we are already a bit late, maybe you can take it uh, uh, offline. Or you have you have one minute to answer. Let, can let you me, maybe... Can I yeah. just ask the question a little more clearly, perhaps? Yeah. When you did your fitting, you increased at the very highest frequencies. The, the noise level went up a little bit. I just wonder if you wanted to comment a little bit more on that. That, you know, that your fitting suppressed the noise in the range you were trying to do it very well. At the very highest frequencies, the noise gets a little bit worse. I was just looking for a comment on that. Um, when I showed the result of the long uh, crosstalk experiment, I can quickly go back. Um, then we didn't only had the um, the noise at the injection frequencies, 
but we had also the decrease at higher frequencies. And this is the region where we um, originally uh, had the bump. So you find here the 20 millihertz and the total length coupling bump was going up till um, 200 millihertz. Um, so by um, yeah, by the subtraction of that model, we also always also um, decreased the noise at this bump, um, which of course also de de depend on the um, test mass alignments. Okay. Thank you very much, Marie Sophie. Maybe we, you can add some more details so, offline and we go quickly to Sara Pachowski that uh, we talk about uh, uh, post processing subtraction of tilt length noise in LISA. Sara, you can share your screen. Hello. Um, so uh, thank you very much for the introduction. I hope uh, you will be soon be able to see my starting slide also. So um, this talk is about how we can subtract uh, the tilt to length noise in LISA in the data processing. Um, and today um, I have the opportunity to explain this to you on behalf of our little team, um, which is uh, listed here and which consists of Roberta Giusteri, Martin Hewitson, Nikos Canesis, Jörn Fitzsimmons, Guton Rana and Gerhard Heinzel. So, um, this little talk is structured as follows. In the last talk, you have already learned what tilt to length noise is and what we saw about in LISA Pathfinder. So, I will just briefly highlight the aspects which are different in LISA. We have developed um, a procedure of how to subtract tilt to length noise in the post processing, and I'll try to walk you through it with a little sketch. Um, then I will show you the results which we obtained um, with this procedure in our nominal configuration. And then at the end of the talk, I'll summarize the results and the steps. So let me continue with two facts about LISA, um, which are very important for this talk. So first, let me remind you that um, each of the three LISA spacecrafts host two moving optical sub-assemblies, or in short, MOSA. So they contain the telescope, the optical bench, and the gravity reference sensor with the test mass. And um, you can see them here um, as uh, the golden cubes, these um, black squares, and um, we mark the telescope in orange. And um, the second important thing for, to know for this talk is that the measurement of the changes in proper distance in between the two test masses along one arm is actually split into three interferometer measurements, as also shown here on the right. So um, the first is the test mass to optical bench um, measurement in a local spacecraft, which is called spacecraft one here. And um, then we have the measurements of the changes in relative distance in between the two optical benches on the distance satellites. And it is followed um, by the measurement of, um, of the um, test mass to displacement with respect um, to the optical bench on the far satellite in spacecraft two. And now this talk focuses on the intersatellite interferometer measurement, or in short, ISI, um, which is in between the two um, spacecraft. Then, um, in the last talk, you already learned that tilt to length noise means that an angular jitter or tilt couples into the longitudinal phase which readout, um, which is used for a length measurement. And um, on the right here, um, you find an example for this geometric tilt to length um, coupling of a single MOSA. So in this case, and for small angles, the tilt to length noise, um, delta P, um, is proportional to uh, the misalignment between the beam and the center of the rotation. Um, this is denoted as Y here, and um, the jitter, eater. And um, this results um, from uh, misalignments in the optical system. So in general, um, tilt to length noise is the combination of geometric and non-geometric effects, such as uh, wavefront errors. So in this talk, um, we will focus on uh, LISA in the intersatellite interferometer, which is mainly driven by the Moser angular jitter with respect to the incoming beam.
And if you would like to know more about um, to, to length noise in Lisa in general, I um, would recommend the talk by um, my colleagues uh, Davy and Alvarez um, on uh, EFUCAT simulations for teal to length noise um, analysis in Lisa, which is one of the pre recorded um, talks here. So, um, the tilt to length noise mitigation in LISA um, is planned to be done in several steps. So here on the right, um, you see the estimated level um, of the noise in TDIX after each of these steps. So after careful integration, um, tilt to length noise is estimated to lead to the TDIX output, which is shown here in pink. And um, after the application of the dedicated beam alignment mechanism, um, we expect to be able to reduce uh, the noise such that we reach um, the green curve here. So this um, is unfortunately still above um, the requirement for the um, instrument noise. Um, and it corresponds um, to a predicted in-flight tilt length coupling uh, values of 2.3 um, millimeter per radian. So this last step here, from green to black, is um, what this talk is about. So in this black trace, um, the remaining tilt to length noise is no longer limiting and we are below um, the required noise level. And um, so this assumes that the TTL coefficients of um, around 2.3 millimeter per radian have been um, estimated to within an accuracy of 0.1 millimeter per radian. And so what you can clearly see here is that unless mitigated, um, tilt to length is a major noise source in the TDI output data. And in this talk, I want to show you that we can indeed estimate the TTL coefficients to the required accuracy and um, subtract tilt to length noise coupling. And um, this subtraction is um, planned to be part of the initial um, noise reduction pipeline or short INREP, um, which brings L0 to L1 data. And if you want to know more about this pipeline, um, please have a look at the talk by Shweta Shah in the instrumentation parallel session tomorrow. So, um, all that said, um, let me try to explain um, you the procedure with one example. So, um, assume that in reality, or as we also like to say in Mother Nature, we only have the jitter of Moser 3 1 along phi at a given time, um, T0, and we have this sine wave uh, shape. And we assume that all other Mosers and spacecrafts are perfectly quiet. In this example, we furthermore ignore um, that we have laser frequency noise and assume also different tilt to length coupling coefficients concerning received um, or short RX and transmitted beams, TX, alongside a few other um, assumptions that I won't go into detail here. So if we have that, then uh, the impact of tilt to length coupling onto the measurements can be modeled um, by a linear model in uh, two degrees of freedom. Always it's um, a coupling coefficient times a true um, Mose jitter. We can then split up um, these contributions into the Rx and uh, Tx path. And um, in this example, this expression becomes uh, more simple because we just uh, consider a phi rotation. So we just have to cope with this bit. And um, then uh, nominally, um, so outside from the simplified example, um, we would have four coefficients per Moser. And so we have six Moser and therefore in total, um, 24 coefficients. So um, for the interferometric measurement of this example jitter, also the phase locking is relevant. Indeed, uh, this method is used for frequency stabilization to one uh, primary laser. And in this example that we are going through now, um, we chose the locking scheme A, which is shown here on the right. Okay, um, now um, let us consider the interferometric measurements um, that we are dealing with. So one is the so-called uh, differential wavefront sensing or short DWS measurement, um, which is um, a measurement of the rotation that we experienced. But then we also have um, the two direct tilt to length um, coupling effects in the longitudinal measurements in the intersatellite interferometer 3.1 and 1.3. So, um, the Rx effect is in the local spacecraft and the Tx effect in the remote spacecraft. And um, with that, we already have um, 
have the sine wave um, jitter at the original time and delayed by one time the uh, light travel time along the arm. Then, um, considering the phase locking configuration A, we obtain um, so-called echoes of these pulses also in the intersatellite interferometers to 1, 1, 2 and 3, 1 um, with the corresponding delays. So we call this echo type 1 and they are due to the phase locking. So, um, when we look at what we can uh, see from this, then later from laser down to Earth, then um, only the DWS measurement of the rotation and the interferometer measurements will be available via telemetry. So the true jitters will not be known. And um, we then apply two parts of data processing to this. So part one is shown on this slide. And um, here in the right hand side of the diagram, we start um, with the fact that we have a measure um, of the jitters via the DWS, that means um, they are the true jitter plus uh, some sensing noise. Then we apply our TTL model to these measurements to obtain um, an estimate of the respective TTL coefficient. And, um, um, or in better words of the contribution corresponding to this um, Co respective coefficient. And um, since the true values are not known here, um, we put a scale factor instead. And so like this, we have an estimate of the tilt to length um, impact for in the longitudinal measurement. And um, then in the second step of the data processing, we apply um, time delay interferometry to both um, the original uh, longitudinal measurements as shown here on the left and that's like what is always um, happening and um, we also um, do this to for each of the estimated um, tilt to length contributions and then um, TDI undoes these echoes um, type 1 from phase locking and um, it adds um, the same um, echoes to all data streams since um, the exact same delays are applied um, as are illustrated here in this um, TDIX picture on the left. So in the next step we estimate the coefficients uh, via noise minimization between uh, the sum of all these TTL and TDIX um, contributions and uh, the longitudinal TDIX measurement and um, then uh, if, we if we get them and in reality, it's also more complicated than just um, looking at TDIX. However, for this example, we this shall be enough. And um, well, then these are used to multiply the pre-computed terms and um, they are all um, summed up. And if you do that right, you get the same um, amplitude as you have in the um, original um, longitudinal TDIX measurement. And then you can subtract and get rid of that. So. Um, let me proceed with a few more details on the TDL coefficient estimation um, also beyond the simple example. So um, this is possible only after TDI um, because um, you have to get uh, rid of the laser frequency noise. However, um, the tilt uh, the tilt to length noise is then mixed in TDI from the different MOSAs. And um, let's have a look at um, TDIX for one example. Um, for example, ITER in here. So you can see that already we have um, eight coefficients just along ITER and just in TDIX and they get all mixed together. And um, in total you have so 16 coefficients in TDIX and um, to estimate the total uh, 24 coefficients we make use of TDIX, Y and Z. And um, we estimate them on a 24 hours time scale where the changes in spacecraft separation are negligible, which means that we can have this linear um, TTL model after TDI. And in fact, we don't use X, Y and Z to estimate the coefficients, but we um, transferred um, them to A, E and T as given here and then um, estimate the coefficients via noise minimization in frequency domain um, as described here and we use A, E and D um, together at the same time. So um, with this I would like to come to the um, um, to the results of our nominal um, 
uh, yeah, to the results um, with our nominal uh, simulation setup. And I'm sorry, I'm aware that I'm running out of time. So um, yeah, we use it. We use an open loop simulator with all coefficients um, set to the nominal value of 2.3 millimeter per radian. And so um, we don't also consider tilt length noise in the test mass interferometer. We have a number of um, essential noise sources included, which are given here with their respective um, values at 0 0.01 hertz, um, as estimated from current um, LISA noise uh, budget. Okay. Um, so I have to speed up a bit uh, then um, in our nominal configuration, here is the plot for um, the TDIX output and the estimated total length um, contribution in red and compared to this requirement. And if we start to subtract in the time domain using the true simulated values, um, we obtain the cyan curve. And um, if we use um, the values which we estimated via noise minimization, you get the blue crosses here and the difference is pretty small as indicated here in green. And um, yes, so we fulfill the requirement of 0 0.1 millimeter per radian. And um, what else? Yes, you can find more details in uh, our paper so quite soon. And with that, I would like to already conclude and say that um, the remaining tilt length noise has to be subtracted in post-processing. We have to use the WS measurements to estimate the tilt length contribution. And this method that we presented relies on noise minimization. Um, yes, and with our simulation based on the current knowledge that worked, and um, we have also validated the methods for different noise scenarios. And in the future, we will test the procedure for more realistic scenarios, such as gaps, glitches, and gravitational wave signals to show that we still fulfill this. And um, yeah, we will also continue testing with other and more realistic simulators. And with that, I would like to thank you and apologize for the delay. Oh, you are just uh, two minutes late. So we have still three minutes. Uh for questions. Thank you very much, Sarah. Your, your uh, talk was very clear and interesting. Is there any question for uh, Sarah? Well, otherwise, I have one. You mentioned in the last uh, slides uh, the fact that you uh, will repeat uh, your analysis or uh, considering the, the presence maybe of glitches, so other source of noise. So what do you expect uh, will be the impact of those uh, features uh, in these procedures? Um, so I think the impact um, can, of course, depend very much on uh, the um, the number of uh, the glitches which we have um, and then uh, their amplitude and um, then also the frequency range because um, now we, we fit between um, 1 millihertz and uh, 0 0.1 hertz. So it depends on where um, the, like um, which frequency range of the spectrum they affect and how broad um, they are. Yeah, I think those are a few of the criteria. And yeah, I think also it will depend on maybe um, if they occur in different interferometers at the same time or not. So that's what I see now, but uh, we hope to have, yeah, good results. So that you have to, to, to study and to investigate further. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other question for Sarah? I don't see any questions on in, the, in the chat. Maybe the people need some time to, to think about what you just Maybe they will send or um, questions later. Thank you again, Sarah. And uh, so we go ahead uh, with the last uh, um, talk of this first part before the break that will be given by Dan uh, George. And the title is uh, Using Fisher Matrices to Constrain Tilt to Length Coefficient Within TDI. Hi, thank you. Um, hi, I'm Don George, a graduate student at the University of Florida. And uh, today I wish to talk about some of the work that we were doing uh, to constrain tilt-to-length tilt noise using fish information. Um, this work was supervised by PEP and also in conjunction with Paul Fulda and Guido. Uh, I also wish to thank uh, Sarah and Marie for providing some context on, on this problem. But I also apologize for any possible confusion because we use slightly different uh, nomenclature. So let's start with the motivation. Um, 
A MOSA, if it jitters, um, can introduce up to 50 picometers per root towards length runs, um, as you can see here. And so we wish to subtract it. And the question we wish to answer is how well we can uh, remove tilt to length noise uh, in the context of time delay interferometry. So to correct TTL, as Sarah mentioned, uh, we need the DWS witness channels to measure and keep track of how the angles change for the, all the different degrees of freedom. And using these witness channels, we can calibrate TTL and remove it in post-processing. And so we answer this question quantitatively uh, using the fish information, which lets us to uh, calculate the lower error bound on each tilt to length term, and furthermore, quantify the residual after subtraction. And also it helps us to check how it depends on the uh, residual spacecraft jitter model that you consider. So some assumptions that we make is that, um, so we start with TDI 2.0. Uh, we're using the simple Michelson interferometers X, Y, and Z uh, for in-plane and out-of-plane and roll uh, degrees of freedom for the spacecraft and MOSA jitter. And because of the magnification in the science interferometer, uh, we're mainly only concerned with the science interferometer tilt to length coefficients. And for simplicity, uh, although these tilt to length coefficients can change over a wide uh, period of time, for the time periods that we're interested in, we're going to assume that this, these coefficients are static. We assume that we have some uh, noise floor along with the tilt to length, and we assume that this is not contaminated by laser frequency noise. Uh, because we assume that we know the uh, delays along the arms perfectly well. Uh, for a uh, more realistic case, we assume that we have a frequency plan. And in our case, we assume a PLL scheme with the primary laser being on MOSA 1. Uh, and I will eventually present some results that show um, how tilt to length uh, differs for different cases. So case A being the LISA requirement jitter and case B being one of the models that's being used in LISA SIM and its noise profiles. So this is the model that we consider. Uh, so if you just look at the science interferometer signals and we're just looking at the tilt to length, if uh, spacecraft one jitters, it uh, obtains these tilt to length uh, noise terms. And this is uh, denoted by K1RX, um, which is the tilt length associated with MOSA1, and it's due to local jitter on MOSA1. And STI1 is our DWS signal that measures uh, the change in angle. And similarly for MOSA1 prime. Um, of course, the other spacecrafts can also jitter, and this is what we see. If spacecraft two and three also jitter, we get these additional terms being measured on spacecraft one. And so K2 prime TX and K3 TX, sorry, this should say TX, um, is telling you that this coefficient is due to jitter from a far spacecraft. Um, of course, these are not the only terms in the interferometer. Obviously, we want gravitational waves, but if we have uh, other noise terms such as laser phase noise and test mass acceleration noise, uh, we wish to characterize these and get rid of laser phase noise. And so we can't apply the Fisher matrix formalism uh, on the science interferometer signals. And that's why we need to move to TDI 2.0. Um, so TDI 2.0 accounts for flexing arms uh, while still removing laser phase noise. So uh, this TDI combination is some algebraic quantity which is appropriately time shifted uh, versions of the interferometer signals. And what we're mainly interested in is the TTL terms. So if you look at the time domain uh, part of TTL and take the Fourier domain, the Fourier transform, uh, this is what we see. So again, we have the K1 RX times Psi1, except now this is the Fourier transform. Um, we see the K1TX with some phase, and this phase comes entirely because of the, the time delay uh, that's introduced in TDI or, in, uh, or the physical delay that it experiences. 
And so because of this delay, we can find these coefficients independently, which we'll see. Uh, one may notice that some of the coefficients are uh, clumped together, which means that we can't disentangle it um, if we just use TDIX. Um, and this is the H is the transfer function that we have um, for TDI 2.0. And for this slide, we just assume that the delays are equal uh, just to make the equations a bit more compact. Okay, so uh, we saw what the TTL form looks like, and now we have to look at the, the noise floor associated uh, that we consider. So in case A, we have the solid black curve uh, that's dominated in the low frequency regime by uh, test mass acceleration noise, and in the high frequency regime by shot noise. Uh, case B, is this dash dot curve. And you can see the main difference between these two curves, the Lisa Sim and the requirement, is that we also consider some gravitational wave background. So you can see that these uh, noise curves are very similar. Um, so let's move on to the DWS signals themselves, which um, is one of the most important parts um, of the results. So if we, or impacts the results the most. So if we have, um, if you consider case A, which is this blue curve, LISA requirement, um, it's similar for both the spacecraft and the MOSA. Um, this uh, orange curve is LISA SIM, and it has some fall off in the high frequency regime because we expect some uh, fall off due to the natural jitter, sorry, the natural inertia of the spacecraft. And this will play a big role in our results, as we will see. Uh, we have something similar for pitch as well, or out of plane jitter. And here I've uh, just shown you how the spacecraft and MOSA uh, jitters are combined. Uh, you can see there's some symmetry in yaw, but not in pitch because of the, the role aspect of the spacecraft. So how can we use fish information um, to predict the errors? So what you get from the fish information is the covariance matrix which is just the inverse of the fish matrix. And this covariance matrix is just the error covariance matrix. And you can find your residuals from this matrix. Now, if you're interested in individual components, um, you can use what's called the kramer rao bound, uh, which tells us that the lower bound uh, error on uh, our coefficients is limited by the covariance matrix itself. And here we have the integral form of the, the fish information. So we're just integrating over Fourier frequencies and considering the slopes of the uh, TDI combinations, TTL terms, with respect to a particular coefficient. And so, as you might guess, since we're dealing with the Fourier domain, we avoid lengthy time domain simulations. These calculations are very quick and easy to modify uh, the signals and the noise, and it kind of helps in um, understanding things a bit better. But these fish information uh, simulations have to be cross-checked, and we do this with time domain simulations uh, for both cases. And how we do this is that we have some Monte Carlo simulation with uh, 5,000 realizations of the noise. We inject some coefficients by uh, and create this artificial data from a uniform distribution. And then using the DWS witness channels, um, one can do a least squares fit to estimate these coefficients. And once we've done that, you can create a distribution uh, for these parameters, for these coefficients, and just read off what the standard deviation is for a particular coefficient. These can then be compared with what we get with the fish information. Uh, case B has a lower number of simulations uh, just because Lisa Sim, excuse me, is a much uh, more computationally expensive uh, software. So here are our results on the uncertainties for individual coefficients. And here we just show TDIX. So the, the C and D terms are our coefficients in yaw and in pitch. And in these two columns, uh, we have the values from the uncertainties that the fish information matrix gives us. And in parentheses, we have the values cross-checked uh, 
uh, from the least square solution. And so you can see that the fish information predicts only the uncertainty, not the values themselves. Um, and you might notice that some of these coefficients are coupled together. Uh, you might think that you can't disentangle it, but if it turns out that if you use TDI X, Y, and Z, that you can find each coefficient independently. And this is useful uh, if one finds some problem on a particular MOSA, you can, um, you can work backwards and see uh, which MOSA might be prob problematic depending on the coefficient that you get. And so this will help with uh, future alignment problems. Um, <clears throat> one major difference between these cases that you can see is that in case A, we have about five micrometers per radian uh, uncertainty, but in case B, we have about 200. And remember how I said that the noise profiles are very similar? This means that this difference has to be purely from angular jitter. So again, these are the DWS curves for yaw. Uh, for case A, which is this blue curve, and case B, which is this uh, orange curve. And because of the very low power that we have in case B, which we expect from the natural inertia of the spacecraft, this leads to lower calibration accuracy. And this is not to say that um, the least requirement values are much better, but one has to be careful because the LISA requirement jitter is not realistic. And the accuracy that you would get if you were to use a LISA requirement jitter is misleading because of this large difference in power. Uh, but all is not lost. Um, even though the individual values for the coefficients may be a bit high in case B, uh, what really matters is the overall subtraction or the residual that you would get um, after uh, so five minutes. Okay, sorry. Um, so we want the residual to be below the noise floor. And uh, if we have some noise floor that we get from the previous plot, uh, one can see how the residual of both cases look like. So you can see that the residual predicted by the fish information matrix uh, in case A is below one picometer per root hertz for all the frequency bins. And this is about a thousand level subtraction, uh, sorry, suppression, uh, if you assume that all the coefficients are, let's say, five millimeters per radian. But however, this is again, not a very realistic uh, jitter profile. Case B um, is still below the noise profile, uh, except it's a bit worse than the uh, case A, uh, again, because you have a more realistic jitter. But we are still below the noise floor, which is good news. Um, and it's below about 10 picometers per root hertz for all the frequency bins. Uh, so this is the plot with all the curves in case anyone was interested to compare each other, them with each other. Um, but yes, uh, for future work, we hope to consider uh, more mature jitter models. And in the event that these more mature jitter models um, produce residuals that are above the noise floor, uh, one can investigate uh, what happens if you inject jitter at high frequencies. And because of the framework that we have, this is easy to do. Um, because we have the model to uh, put in any kind of jitter for the uh, spacecraft or MOSAs. Um, and because this is a space mission, we don't know what kind of uh, noise profile that we expect. And so we want to consider what happens if you have some unknown noise profile, if we can predict this, and also if we can handle any glitches that are given to us. But uh, thank you for listening. Uh, any questions? Thank you very much, John. We see if uh, we have some questions. So, David, do you have to worry about Mosa to Mosa jitter on one spacecraft, or is that small enough to be neglected? Um, that is one thing that we haven't considered. Um, so. The jitter that is common in both MOSAs is the spacecraft jitter. 
uh, but you can construct a model where the spacecraft is silent and you just have all the noise in the MOS cells. Um, at that point, they would be correlated and I think the results would not change much. Okay, David, it's okay. Uh, maybe I have, I have a question. You also are mentioning the, the uh, possible impact of uh, uh, unknown noise uh, sources on your analysis. Uh, which is the worst kind of noise that uh, would make your analysis uh, much more complicated or difficult? Is there uh, an specific kind of noise uh, with some features in the spectrum that would make everything more, much more complicated? So because we have, um, because the higher frequency jitter helps us, mm -hmm. any uh, additional glitches that would show up here would hurt us if we don't have uh, commensurately larger uh, spacecraft jitter. So that would hurt us here. Okay. Okay, any, any further question for Don? So maybe people will think uh, during the, the break uh, about further questions. So we thank Don uh, again for his uh, beautiful talk. And uh, I think we can, uh, we can have the break and we can reconvene in 15 minutes uh, or better at uh, uh, 21 uh, 15, so a quarter past nine.